Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so, so much that you have given us such a sure foundation. When everything we would construct would be on shifting sands, unstable, bound for destruction, what you have granted to us by your grace is rock solid. And we thank you. May we be humbled all over again this morning by your mercies. May we be brought low by your love. May we be made again to feel small by your undeserved grace so that you might be exalted, so that the glory of your grace and the freedom of your mercy might be lifted up, that we would see and we would proclaim that from you and through you and to you are all things. To you, O Lord, be the glory in Jesus forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 9 as we continue our study of this letter, this letter written by Paul to believers at the city of Rome, this letter written by God through the Apostle Paul, even to us. I'm going to begin this morning by retelling a story as I heard it told by Dr. R.C. Sproul. Dr. Sproul was teaching at a Christian college back in the 1960s, and he was teaching his very first class. It was an introduction to the Old Testament class. There were 250 college freshmen in this class, and he had assigned three small term papers to be turned in at various points throughout the semester. September 30th at noon, the first assignment was due, and 225 students came in with their term papers, leaving 25 who trembling before Dr. R.C. Sproul said, please, sir, don't give us an F. We didn't make the adjustment from high school to college. We were unprepared to turn in this assignment, but we won't let it happen again. And so Dr. Sproul gave them an extra two days to turn in this first assignment. October 30th rolled around. The second assignment was due, and only 200 students brought in their term papers. 50 did not. And these 50 complained to Dr. Sproul, Sir, this weekend it was homecoming, and we didn't budget our time very well, and we did not prepare properly. And Dr. Sproul said, Okay, I, I will let you turn it in a couple of days late, but don't let it happen again. And the class literally broke out into spontaneous singing, and they sang, We love you, Prof. Sproul. Oh, yes, we do. He says he rode the tide of this newfound popularity all the way to November 30th when 150 students came in with their term papers, leaving 100 delinquents. He said, where's your term papers? And they responded, hey, prof, don't worry about it. We'll have it for you in a couple of days. So Dr. Sproul calls one out and says, Johnson, where's your paper? I don't have it for you, prof, but I'll get it. And Dr. Sproul took out his black grade book, marked down F for that assignment. Harrison, where's your paper? I don't have it. F. And then with one voice, a rising protest in the crowd called out, that's not fair. And R.C. Sproul said, what did you say? And they repeated more loudly, that's not fair. Dr. Sproul called on Johnson again. Johnson, did you just say that's not fair? Yes, sir, I did. So it's justice that you want. Yes. It seems to me I remember you were late the last time the paper was due, weren't you? Yes. F for that one too. God forbid that I not be just. Now... Who else wants justice? (laughs) Not a mumbling word was uttered. Is God fair? Is God fair in his dealings with sinful humanity? If God has chosen to be gracious to Isaac and not to Ishmael, as we saw last week, 
if God has chosen to be gracious to Jacob and not to Esau? Is God fair? That is the message of the text we're looking at this morning, Romans 9, 14 to 18. I'd invite you to read along as we ask and answer this question from God's word. Paul writes, What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills, or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you. And that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. The main idea of this passage up on the screen here for you is simply this. God's sovereign selection of sinners to be saved according to his own free purpose is not unjust. God's sovereign selection of sinners to be saved according to his own free purpose is not unjust. And it is not unjust for two reasons. Those two reasons is what we'll be looking at this morning. Let's begin just with the supposed problem set up for us in verse 14. Paul says, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? Is God unjust? And this word here for just or justice is the same as the word for righteousness or right in the English language. In our English Bibles, it's somewhat confusing that we've split up one word into two different words, just and right, or justification And righteousness. All of these are the same word group, both in Hebrew in the Old Testament and in Greek in the New Testament. We see this whole idea of justice or righteousness is a this is a critical issue in our Bibles. It's a critical issue in the book of Romans. And and the question about whether or not God is just in his dealings. This is a critical issue that's at stake. Is God unrighteous in what he does? Has he violated the standards of what is just? Is God capricious? Is God inconsistent? Is he unpredictable? Does God go back on his word or on his purposes or on his promises? But this is a critical issue in the book of Romans. If we look back at Romans chapter 1, after his introduction, Paul outlines for us the theme of the book, Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news. Why is Paul not ashamed? Because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, Jew first and then Gentiles. Why is the gospel the power of God for salvation? For, verse 17, in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is manifest, or the righteousness of God is made known, or the justice of God is put forward. This idea of the justness of God's dealings with sinners or the rightness of God's interactions with us is critical to the very gospel that Paul proclaims. Why do we need a righteousness revealed in the gospel? Verse 18 of chapter 1 tells us, because the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What man needs and what the good news of the gospel provides is a righteousness outside of us given as a free gift through the work of God and his son, Jesus Christ. We need a righteousness we don't have inherently. We cannot produce by our own resources. And so in the gospel, the manifest righteousness of God is given freely to sinners who believe. But this righteousness provided in the gospel has to be done in a righteous way. If the gospel itself violates justice or rightness, 
how could it then convey rightness to those who need it? And so Paul, in the book of Romans, unfolds for us exactly how this takes place. If you skip forward a couple of pages to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Paul begins to detail for us how this gift of righteousness in the gospel is actually accomplished by a process which is itself a manifestation of justice or rightness. Paul writes, but now apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested or has been made known, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God. Whose righteousness is this? This is God's righteousness. How does it arrive? Through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. There's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely as a gift by His grace. And that comes through the redemption which is in Messiah Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. That is, God put Jesus forward on the cross, suspended in midair between heaven and earth as a propitiation. That is, a satisfaction of divine wrath by a substitute. And that propitiation work of Christ was done in his blood through faith to demonstrate God's righteousness. Why does this demonstrate his righteousness? Verse 26 of Romans 3, because... God needed to be just and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus. God had to be just and the justifier. You see, God could not just wink at our sins. The whole issue of the gospel and and the justice at stake in the gospel is this question. How is a sinner made right before a holy God while God still maintained his reputation as holy? How does a sinner get forgiven and God uphold the standards of of justice in the universe? He can't simply let bygones be bygones. He has to do this propitiatory work through an innocent substitute where our sins are actually transmitted to him, transferred to him, credited to his account. So that every crime that every believer has ever committed, past, present, and future, is actually placed on Jesus at the cross so that God could fully punish it. This is exactly what Scott Demarest was speaking about during our communion time. An infinite, eternal lake of fire worth of wrath against believers poured out on Jesus instead. And this is the way for God to give rightness, righteousness, the perfect conformity to his standards of what is just, as a free gift to believers, while still doing something about the sin, while still paying for the sin. And Christ pays what we could never pay. And he does so as our substitute in our place. This idea of the justness of God and the righteousness which he gives. Again, these are the same word in Greek. The idea of our justification could in one sense be be called our righteousification. That is, we are declared righteous as a free gift by God's grace. And so for the question to to come up in Romans chapter 9, is God's gracious dealing with sinners unjust, provokes in Paul the strongest of negative answers. May it never be, he says. Some translations might say, God forbid. There's no way that God could be unjust in these things. The very reason Jesus died on the cross was to save sinners in a way that upheld God's justice. Sin gets punished and the guilty get forgiven. God maintains his own reputation as holy and you and I get to live. Justice is upheld and God is able to extend mercy. Justice is critical to God. It's essential to the gospel itself. So is God unjust in his dealings with mankind when he chooses to save some and not others. 
That is truly the question at stake here. Is it unjust for God to bypass the firstborn and choose the younger son? Is it unjust for God to select one twin for blessing before either is born, before either has done anything good or bad? It is, is it unjust for God's purpose, according to choice, to stand? These questions provoke in the heart of natural man complaint. We want to say like R.C. Sproul students, that's not fair. It's unjust that some receive mercy. We almost want to demand from our flesh that God would show mercy to all if he's to show mercy to any. And yet, this is not what God has been about. Paul says, by no means may it never be. There is no injustice with God. And and what follows in verse 15 is reason number one why there's no injustice in it. Reason number two comes in verse 17. And reason number one is followed by an inference and reason number two is followed by an inference. What we have here is a cascade of explanation of why God's dealings in mercy with sinful humanity is not unjust. One explanation, and then it's inference, and another explanation, and it's inference. But all of these explanations, you must know, are God-oriented explanations. They begin with God, and they terminate with God. We, we may think that we want something that comes down to some sort of human reasoning. Something that accords with our fallen sense of justice or propriety. And, and, and just to give you fair warning up front, these two explanations are going to be terribly unsatisfying to anyone looking for an answer outside of God. If you're looking for an appeal above the bar of God's standard of justice, there will not be one. If the answer to the question, is God unjust in showing mercy? If the answer to that question is, no, God's not unjust because God shows mercy to whom he wants to show mercy. And that's where it ends. That will be terribly unsatisfying for those who are looking for an explanation beyond God. For those who are looking for some standard that must be appealed to that's bigger than God, beyond God, that God himself is accountable for. And Paul goes on to explain the answer by means of two Old Testament scenes, both from the book of Exodus. And these really constitute two reasons why God's dealings with sinful mankind are not unjust. And the first reason is simply this. God operates consistent with his own character and purpose. God operates consistent with his own character and purpose. That is reason number one why God's dealings in mercy with sinners is not unjust. I'm going to ask the guys to put up number two on the screen. Go ahead and put that up there. Because point number two is the same as point number one. And we're not going to get to point number two today. We're going to get to that next time we're together. But point number two is that God operates consistent with his own character and purpose. The two reasons why God's dealings in mercy with sinners is not unjust is simply that God is doing what is in keeping with his own character. He's in keeping with what he has designed to do. And I'm going to need the rest of that hot tea. Emmett, son, (laughs) buddy. (coughs) Would you bring that up for me? Love you, buddy. Thank you. And if I might have a refill. Thanks, wife. The difference between these two points is the example that Paul gives to buttress them. Case in point number one is going to be Moses and the nation of Israel in Exodus 32, 33, 34. Case in point number two is going to be Pharaoh and God's dealings with Pharaoh from Exodus 4 and on through the Exodus narrative. 
So let's look this morning at point number one. God operates consistent with his own character and purpose. And the example on display for us is with Moses. And we read this in Romans 9, 15 and 16. Paul says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. And verse 15 is the explanation from an Old Testament example. And then verse 16 is the inference drawn from that example. God's answer is simply this. I will have mercy on who I want to have mercy. And the quote comes from Exodus 33, 19. I want us to turn to Exodus chapter 32. We need to pick up this narrative to see exactly what God is up to here so that we can make sense of this quote in Romans chapter 9. Turn to Exodus chapter 32, second book in your Bible. And to set the stage here, the book of Exodus means something like exit, (laughs) right? Um, What exit are we talking about? We're talking about the exit of God's people, the nation of Israel, probably some two million people who were enslaved to the Egyptians. They'd been in Egypt some 400 years, and, and the latter part of that history was a history of enslavement. They were forced labor. Uh, to build the pyramids and whatever else Pharaoh wanted them to build. You you wondered, how how did those things get built? Well, he had a bunch of people that he made work for him. And and the exit of Israel out from under slavery under Pharaoh is the story of the book of Exodus. And and you know how this story goes. If you you watch that guy who heads up the NRA um, uh, and the Stone Tablets, the, the old movie, uh, you know, something of the narrative. I know there's been cartoon versions of this since then. The reality is the people of Israel had a first-hand uh, view of God's supernatural, miraculous rescue. There was no Harriet Tubman and secret underground railroad There were not human means to accomplish the exit from slavery in Egypt. It was supernatural, undeniable, miraculous intervention of God. Beginning with the plagues on Egypt, you know, that Moses goes into Pharaoh's uh, room, throne room, and says, let God's people go. Pharaoh says no. And God brings a litany of plagues on the nation of Israel, or nation of Egypt. And these plagues are discriminatory. They fall on the people of Egypt and not on the people of Israel. And plague after plague after plague comes onto the land. And Pharaoh says, okay, you can go. And then he says, no, you can't. I don't want to lose all of my slave labor. And it culminates with the death of a firstborn in every household in Egypt. And then the people go. Pharaoh changes his mind again and chases them with his whole army. And the people cornered against the sea figure they were, God has just brought us out to kill us right next to the sea. And, and what does God do? Opens it up, lets his people pass on dry land. Pharaoh's army follows and the sea closes back in over them. And God in front of the Israelites demolishes the mightiest army on the earth right before their eyes. God goes on to provide for them with water out of rocks and food in the desert and clothes that don't wear out. These people had a front row seat to miraculous, radical, salvific operation of God on their behalf. There was no mistaking who was doing these things. These are not uh, random uh, natural disasters that Moses blames God for and has an excuse to get the people out. These are undeniable, supernatural, life-altering things that every Israelite saw firsthand and should never have forgotten. And we come to Exodus 32. Right on the heels of all of this amazing work of God, 
Let's read together a little bit this scene. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, where was Moses? Moses was up on Mount Sinai uh, speaking with God, hearing from God. The, The people assembled about Aaron and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. What a staggering, thank you, Josh. What a staggering response for these people who had seen God work in such unbelievable ways. Aaron, make us a God, a God that will go before us. Uh, They wanted something tangible. They, uh, They were idolaters at heart, and they had been idolaters by practice, and they had been a land of idolatry where the common custom was make something that you can hold in your hands and bow down to. And they wanted some sort of representation that could go with them. We don't know what happened to this guy, Moses. So Aaron said to them, verse 2, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took them from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. What? What? I know that scholars debate over whether or not Aaron was trying to represent the strength of Yahweh with a golden cow, or whether he was reverting to the gods of Egypt in his representation of who really gets credit for bringing them out. Neither one of those is a good answer. As if you could boil down the one true God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, into some image, some likeness. There's a reason God prohibited image making. You you can't make anything that actually captures who God is and what he is like. Much less melted down jewelry from your ears, shaped like a cow. What an infinite insult this is. So the next day they rose early, verse 6, they offered burnt offerings, they brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. Verse 7 Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, go down at once, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. God is disassociating himself from his people. Remember the refrain of the Old Testament, I will be their God and they will be my people. That's not what God is saying right here. I don't want these people to be my people. They have quickly turned aside from the way that that I've commanded them. They've made for themselves a molten calf and they worshiped it. And they've sacrificed to it, and they've said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And Yahweh said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation, Moses. The twelve tribes of Moses. Moses did not say, all right, sounds good. What did Moses do? Moses prayed. (laughs) This ought to make us all want to pray. Look at verse 11. Then Moses entreated Yahweh his God and said, O Yahweh, why does your anger burn against your people whom you've brought out? They're your people. You brought them out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, With evil intent he brought them out to kill them on the mountain and destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and all this land of which I've spoken, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So Yahweh changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. What's going on here? Is God fickle? Is God capricious? Does does God not know how to make up his mind? Can God not make a decision here? What's happening? Moses, in prayer, appeals to God. And he appeals to God on the basis of God's character, his purposes, and his promises. And what does God do? God turns from his desire to destroy the people. He turns from that. He changes his mind from that. What does he change his mind to? He changes his mind to the keeping of his promises, to the fulfilling of his purposes, to 
to the whole claim that these would be my people and I will be their God. And, and, and the promises from Genesis 3.15 all the way up through Genesis 49. Specific promises to the 12 tribes. The, the tribe of Judah, for instance, which through whom would come Messiah who would reign over the earth and forgive our sins. God keeps those promises. Why? Because it's what he was always planning to do. But God planned to accomplish that through the means of intercessory prayer by Moses. This is not different than God's activities with humans throughout biblical history, that God uses means to accomplish his unfailing ends. What do we see on display here? The, the Israelites are not getting what they deserve but they are getting what God promised, mercy. He relented about the harm that they deserved. You know, Moses comes down the mountain and confronts Aaron. What does Aaron say? Well, I mean, we just, we had this jewelry, we, we threw it in and out came this calf. Blame shifting. Moses Grinds it to powder, burns it, and throws it away. <laughs> the people eventually go into mourning over their sin. And Moses returns in Exodus 33 to speak face to face with the Lord. A look at verse 12 of chapter 33. Moses then said to Yahweh, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. I, I need some help here, God. I can't bring this people up by myself. I, I can't make them obey you. I turn my back for a, a few minutes and, and they're idolaters again. They've forgotten the amazing things that you've done on their behalf. Verse 13, now therefore I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I might know you so that I might find favor in your sight. Moses is pleading here for grace. The grace of knowing God and what he is like and, and, and the kinds of things that he does. Only that could be a comfort. And then verse 14, um, God said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. That's, that's the answer. <laughs> That the God would go with us. And Moses says to him, if your presence does not go with us, then don't lead us up from here. I don't want to go anywhere without you. How can it be known, Moses goes on, if, that I have indeed found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? And Yahweh said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and have known you, I have known you by name. And Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. Moses is not putting God to the test here. Moses is longing for God. <laughs> Moses knows that if God doesn't go with him, if the glorious God who keeps promises with sinful people does not go with him, there's no hope for Moses or the people. And God says, verse 19, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. It goes on in chapter 34, verse 6, Yahweh passed in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness to his people. Exodus 34 goes on to say that God also punishes iniquity. He will not leave guilt unpunished, which is an interesting, cryptic, Old Testament declaration pointing us to the cross of Christ, where every sin of everyone who has shown mercy actually gets punished in Christ. There's never a sin that doesn't get punished. The question is, will you suffer for your own sins, or does God show grace to you by causing your sins to be punished in an innocent substitute in your place? What do we see in Exodus 32 and 33 and 34? 
we see rebellious idolatry in the heart of people. And this is the human condition. And we see God's grace to people who do not deserve it. And when Moses sees God's glory, what does God put in front of Moses? He puts in front of Moses his own name. And what does God tie to his name? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I will show you my glory, Moses, and and here is my glory. I will be merciful and gracious and kind and compassionate towards sinners. What we need to understand from this Exodus narrative is that in God proclaiming his name, in God publishing his glory, what is he putting on display? Mercy. Mercy, compassion, grace to the undeserving. And listen, if God does not show mercy to Israel, Israel is finished right then and right there in the desert. What this is revealing to us is that mercy is basic to God's nature. Mercy is basic to God's nature. For God to show mercy to the undeserving is bound up in who he is. It's connected to his very name, and it's a publishing of his own glory. So Paul quotes from Exodus thirty-three nineteen in the middle of this narrative to give us a defense of the freedom of the glory of God to publish his glory, to associate his activities with his freedom to show mercy. Is God unjust? No. God can show mercy to whom he wants to show mercy. This is bound up in his very nature. Paul draws out an inference from this in Romans 9, 16. So then, he says, here's the deduction from this text. It does not depend on the man who wills, nor the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Willing is man's will, his capacity to choose one thing or another. And running is this intensive way to describe human effort. Uh, Paul talks about Gentiles walking in the futility of their mind. Um, This ramps that up just a little bit. It's not just walking, but running. All the best efforts a man could muster are to no effect. Willing is nothing and running is nothing. Why is that? Well, frankly, because the human will won't. Because the will won't. And because the running is all in the wrong direction. Whatever effort might come natural to man is the wrong effort, the wrong way. Not running towards God, but running away from God. There are many protest against Paul's words here, against God's words here, and, and, and want to find something good in the will of man. They, they want to exalt the freedom of the will of man. And they go to their closet in the morning and they pick out a blue shirt or a red shirt and they say, See, I'm free. My will's free. I, I can pick blue shirt. I, I did that of my own free will. And American history has been based on this love of liberty. We will serve no sovereign. That's what's inscribed at the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. (laughs) Meaning, uh, King George isn't going to tell me what to do. Live free or die. These are our mottos. We value liberty and freedom. and, And what we claim for the human constitution is a freedom of will in spiritual things that goes against the truth. Now, it's true that you can walk into your closet and and pick out a blue shirt or red shirt, and and you're not constrained by anything outside of you to choose one or the other unless um, the fashion sense in your home helps direct those choices, as mine sometimes does. But a free will in terms of spiritual capacity... 
Um, we're, we're actually not free to do things contrary to our nature. We might be free to do things spiritually because, in the sense that we're not externally constrained. Right? Nobody outside of me is, is able to make me do one thing or another, spiritually speaking. So I must be free. But if my nature is one of spiritual enslavement and spiritual death, then there are things that I'm not free to do. And the reason I'm not free to do them is not because somebody is holding a gun to my head, but because it's not in my nature to be able to do them. Theologians call this human inability. It's part of the feature of our total depravity. It's like telling a giant tortoise, hey, you're free to fly. Meaning, I'm not holding him down. I haven't clipped his wings. <laughs> But he could flap those flippers all he wants. Have you seen those giant tortoises that look like Volkswagen bugs? You're free to fly. It's not in his nature nor his intrinsic ability to be able to do that. He, sure, he's free, but he's not able. And you ask, well, what about human responsibility? Aren't, aren't humans responsible you're saying that God is justified in having mercy on whom he wants because man can't will and can't run in a way that invokes God to be merciful to him. There's nothing in man that provokes God to be merciful. The only thing man's got going for him is his pitiable condition and his helplessness. And so if he's going to be shown mercy, it must initiate, originate, and terminate with God alone. You're saying God's totally responsible for man's salvation? Yes. That's exactly what this passage is talking about. Well, I want to put human responsibility into this passage. We don't have to. We'll get there at the end of chapter 9, beginning in verse 30. Paul's going to deal with the human responsibility of faith and repentance and belief in Jesus Christ. But those things aren't the cause of God's mercy being dispensed to us as a sinner. Those things are actually the result of God's kindness. This passage of Scripture isn't about human responsibility. This passage is about God's mercy. And without the undeserved initiating mercy of God, no one would be saved from sin. Not one. God wants to extend mercy. But the only ground of that, the only ground of our salvation is election. The, the free choice of God to extend mercy to whom He wants to extend mercy. To put his love on undeserving rebels, irrespective of their lineage or their privilege or their performance. This is, in effect, for God to exercise his godness, his freedom to do as he pleases for his purposes. And listen, there's no injustice in it. There is no injustice in that. For whenever God might be merciful to an undeserving sinner, he's acting in a manner completely in accord with his character, he's being consistent. He will have mercy on whom he has mercy. You say, wait a second, don't, don't the commands of Scripture imply that we have ability to obey them? Doesn't that mean that human freedom is really the ground of salvation? I mean, if God tells me to do something, he's requiring me to do it, expects me to do it, doesn't that mean that I can? Listen, are we commanded to believe, to have faith in the gospel? Yes, that's a command. But faith is a gift from God in salvation, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Acts 13, 48. Are we commanded to repent? Yes, we're commanded to repent. Can you do that on your own? No, repentance is a gift from God, Acts eleven eighteen. Are we commanded to love God and to love others? Yes, first and second commandments. But the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom God has given us, Romans 5, 5. Are we commanded to do good works? Yes, but we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared in advance that we might walk in them, Ephesians 2, 10. Are you and I commanded in the Christian life to persevere? Yes. And it is God who is the one who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, Jude 24. The giving of a command does not imply the ability to comply. A command from God does indicate the rightness of compliance. If God tells you to do something, it's right for you to do it. It doesn't mean that you can. It does mean that you must. 
God has always been about the business of commanding the impossible. Impossible activities that are absolutely necessary. And then in his mercy, on his initiative, by his power, in his love, bringing about the impossible in his people. Consider Deuteronomy 10 and Deuteronomy 30. In Deuteronomy 10, God tells his people, circumcise your hearts. In other words, perform a supernatural spiritual surgery internally. You do that. Command. And in Deuteronomy 30, God comes around and says, I will circumcise their hearts. Matthew 12, 13, God, through Jesus, gave the command to a man with a withered hand, stretch out your hand. Could he do it? Of course not. Jesus commanded it, and he did it. And the power to do it was not intrinsic to the man. It came from Jesus, who miraculously, supernaturally enabled him to obey. Jesus gave a command in John eleven forty three. 43, to a corpse who obeyed. Lazarus, come forth. In all of these things, the human will is not bypassed. Human effort is not non-existent. Listen, Christian, did you believe the gospel? You were commanded to. Yes, you did. Did you repent? Did you turn from idols to the one true and living God? Did you turn from your old life to Christ? Yes, you did, Christian. Do you love God now and do you love others? Yes, you do, and in increasing measure. Do you walk in good works? Yes, you're not a Christian if you don't. Do you labor to persevere in faith? Yes, you must. Did the man with the withered hand stretch out his hand? Yes, he did. Did the lame man take up his pallet and walk? Yes. Did Lazarus obey Jesus walking out of his own tomb after having been dead for four days, after already starting to decompose? Yes. Did Lazarus obey a command? Of course he did. Was his will involved? Yes. But friends, his will was resurrected. Christian, when you believed, your faith was produced. Your repentance was a gift. Your will was rescued from its wontness to a willingness to love Christ for the first time. This is a rescue. Human will and human effort are necessary, but they are not the cause of God's gracious work. God's undeserving, initiating, powerful, selective mercy is the cause. When the human won't all of a sudden will, when the running in the wrong direction gets turned around, when Lazarus, the decomposing corpse, gets up healthy and walks out of the grave, we can only say, wow, look what God did. Listen to Philippians 2.13. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. What if God did not exercise his sovereign, selective grace to save sinners? What if God left salvation up to us? What if God left faith and repentance and love for him up to our abilities, our willingness our efforts. Listen, there are serious barriers to such a thing. I'll give you four. Personal total depravity, collective world depravity, satanic blinding, and judicial hardening. I won't walk through all the passages. If if you want to get the passages on these, email me and I'll send them to you. The truth is, Number one, our personal total depravity means every aspect of who we are naturally is opposed to God at enmity with God. We don't think right, we don't feel right, we don't do right. Sin is not just about the bad things you did. Sin is about the heart, the fountain that produced those things. It's it's about your inability to actually think correctly. What theologians call the noetic effects of sin. Our brains are engaged in hostility of mind against God things need to be transformed from the inside out. Uh, That's number one enemy against you is you. We do not want to will and to run in God's direction. We have to be rescued from our willing and running. Uh, The second barrier, the, the second complication is the world system. You're not the only totally depraved sinner on the earth. 
the entire world population collectively together produces a system opposed to God in its ways that tries to squeeze Christians into the mold of its thinking. The world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Listen, the world hates God and is opposed to God. The world as a system is a barrier to our willing and running for God. Thirdly, satanic blinding. 2 Corinthians 4.4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they don't believe the gospel. And a fourth barrier to our willing and running towards God is God's own judicial hardening. We'll see this laid out for us in a really stark example in Pharaoh uh, next time we're in Romans. But just understand, truths like Psalm 81.12, God gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart to walk in their own devices. Or the threefold in Romans 1 of God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over to further wickedness. Listen, you want to run away from God, he might give you more of what you're asking for. And it would be right for God to do so, it would be judicial for God to do so, and it would come with the consequences of only more sin and more judgment. Listen, these four barriers, your sin, the world's system, satanic blinding, and God's judicial hardening are all against you. And what can overcome these complications? Not your willing, not your running, but the mercy of God. The mercy of God alone is enough to overwhelm and overcome these complications. What if Jesus had left hand straightening to the man in Matthew 12, or pallet carrying up to the lame man in Mark 2, or if he'd left resurrection up to Lazarus? Christian, what would your life look like if God had not intervened? If he had left salvation up to you? This is why Paul says, it does not depend on the man who wills nor the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. One commentator said it this way, the salvation of any man is not to be ascribed to his own goodwill and diligent endeavors to arrive at it, but solely to the purpose of God according to election, which is not of works, but of him who calls. That's the bottom line. Classic work on the will of man, if you're interested in sort of a, 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 a biblical, exegetical, and philosophical dealing with, does man really have free will? Uh, one of the works we've recommended is The Bondage of Will by Luther, but the other would be The Freedom of the Will by Jonathan Edwards. Freedom of the Will is the short title. Here's the long title. An inquiry into the modern prevailing notions of the freedom of the will, which is supposed to be essential to moral agency, virtue and vice, reward and punishment, praise and blame. A very Edwardsian title. You get the gist. There's people that say man's will is free. Well, let's talk about that. And on the title page, the title takes up the whole title page. And in fine print at the bottom, you just get these little markings. R-O-9-16. A reference to this verse. And what does this verse say? It does not depend on man who wills. Right? There shouldn't be anything after the title page. That should be the end of the argument. <laughs> we have no hope unless God has mercy. If God saves any, the only cause is to be found in the purpose and character of God, not in the will or effort of man. And it's no injustice when God mercifully pardons and graciously rescues a sinner. It is in keeping with his character. It is just like God to do this. And why does God save in this way? To crush the pride of man, to exalt the glory and the freedom of God, to magnify his grace. So the second reason that God's sovereign selection of sinners to be saved according to his own free purpose is not unjust is the same as the first. God operates consistent with his own character and purpose. We'll look at that in the life of Pharaoh next time we're in Romans I love what Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.9. He says, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted in Christ Jesus from all eternity. It's a God-centered perspective on salvation. I remember when I was in seminary, I was asked by my friend, some of you in this room may know him, Bert Sulavalli, 
to uh, play the piano for him uh, when he was singing a, a song. The song is, Were It Not For Grace. I'm going to close with these lyrics. I'll never forget Bert not being able to sing the song. He couldn't get through it because he knew the truth of these lyrics. And, and I'll just read these. I, you think about your own life. You think about your own life apart from Christ and what you were able to do and what God did in spite of you. I think these may resonate. Time measured out my days. Life carried me along. In my soul, I yearned to follow God, but knew I'd never be so strong. I looked hard at this world to learn how heaven could be gained, just to end where I began, where human effort is all in vain. Were it not for grace, I can tell you where I'd be, wandering down some pointless road to nowhere, with my salvation up to me. And I know how that would go. The battles I would face, forever running but losing this race, were it not for grace. So here is all my praise, expressed with all my heart, offered to the friend who took my place and ran a course I could not start. And when he saw in full just how much his would cost, he still went the final mile between me and heaven so I would not be lost. Were it not for grace, I can tell you where I'd be, wandering down some pointless road to nowhere with my salvation up to me. And I know how that would go. The battles I would face, forever running but losing the race, were it not for grace. Oh God, we thank you for your grace. It is the only claim we could make. We, we could never boast in our willing. We could never boast in our running. Salvation never depended on these things. It could never depend on these things. The worthless foundation of the shifting sands of our own merit, of our own works, of our own trying, of our own efforts, of our own abilities, of our own supposed goodness. It's flimsy things washed away in the first storm. Shown to be all the emptiness and liability that they actually are. God, I pray that every soul in this room would be built on the firm foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross alone for salvation. God, we beg that no one would show up from this room before that great white throne and that impending lake of fire, clothed only in their own willing, only in their own running, but would they be clothed in the grace of your love through Jesus Christ, the free gift of his righteousness in our place. We ask it in his name.